Great. Well, welcome, everybody, once again. Uh, it's really good to see you all. Uh, this course is uh, about worship ministry. Um, it's BC 311 uh, for the final years. Okay, so uh, in this course, right, worship ministry, we are going to learn about a practical things, theological aspects of worship and practical aspects of ministry, organizational aspects of ministry. So in your notes, uh, uh, which I've shared, by the way, I hope you've downloaded your notes, everybody. Yeah, uh, I've, I've shared it in both the classroom section and the stream section. Um, so if you can have that handy, there's nothing like it. Okay. So uh, in this course, we will cover worship ministry in the Bible. We will go look at the Old Testament and the New Testament, uh, how people in the Bible, you know, worship and how their ministry was organized. Uh, okay, both uh, in the Old and in the New Testament, we will briefly look at uh, how worship was organized in the Tabernacle of Moses. Uh, again, briefly look at how worship was organized in the Tabernacle of David. Uh, you know how Abraham worshipped, and, uh, and and so on and so forth. Okay, so that is worship ministry in the Bible. Uh, chapter two is all about worship in the church. We'll go through. We'll see how the worship ministry has evolved through the ages, right, from the biblical times to the modern era. To 2020, 21 at least. Okay, we'll see how music has evolved, worship ministry has evolved, and uh, chapter three is about organizational aspects. How we how we can go about organizing our worship ministry, uh, you know, um, and how APC functions, how APC has organized uh, um, the worship ministry, right? Um, and then the different forms of music methods used in modern music uh, in worship ministry uh, technology that's used uh, that we can use and uh, developing a local community and uh, as a worshiping body and uh, worship ministry in regional languages and so on and so forth so uh, worship ministry is a little bit different to the praise and worship course that we studied in the first years uh, this is more uh, pr there will be more of a practical topics uh, you know content that will be added um, so so yeah uh, that's about it and uh, let's get started shall we yeah from, we'll go look at first chapter worship ministry in the bible So uh, this chapter is all about, I, I wanted to start off with uh, talking about altars, um, you know, Abraham's altars in specific, but uh, altars in general, right? Um, in this was before there was a tabernacle of Moses or a tabernacle of David, uh, before there was a temple or anything else. This is how the people in the days of the Bible, in the very early days, worship is that they built altars okay um so altars uh like i've mentioned uh in your notes but uh, in generally altars uh, is a is a way to mark a moment with god uh you know it was in a place that god would speak and a person would build altars uh, etc right uh they remind us of where god has shown up in our lives uh, and what he has spoken. Okay, uh, it's also a place to mark your commitment in response to God's word. So all this was a big deal um, back in the day, and um, before they had the Tabernacle of Moses, that's how people worshipped. They would build an altar, and Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They would all build altars, and that is how they would worship. Okay, so it symbolized. Uh, a sacred place uh, of worship okay um, but what comes to your mind when you hear the word altar you can unmute and speak uh, and you can also share in the chat section so when you hear the word altars in whatever context uh, what comes to your mind sacrifice sacrifice yeah okay
Okay, surrender. Sacrifice, surrender, yes. Okay. Forgiveness, yes, okay. Kindness, worship. Yes, forgiveness. Worship, okay. All right, uh, anybody else? Manu, Thomas, what are we, see, there's no right or wrong answers. I just want your thoughts on it, that's it. So feel free to share, you know, whatever you want. So nobody's judging. <laughs> Bowing down before God, okay. It's another place of surrender, right? Actually, sir, I hear the word altar because I've come from the tradition church. The altar, uh, the place of, uh, you know, in CSH is a uh, specific place for the stand and uh, nobody can enter without the uh, that and all. But uh, okay. after that saved, I understand certain things about the altar. Uh, it's always the presence of God where uh, comes and meets the people. Uh, that's what was my mind. Oh, when people worship, the presence of God comes and. Oh, that, that's uh, interesting, isn't it? Thanks for sharing that, also, Thomas. Uh, as in, so, uh, you know, one of the things that I could think of was I mean, I've heard uh, my Catholic friends also say, I'm an altar boy in my church. Uh, you know, and then you, like you also said, there are certain, uh, you know, uh, denominations that have orders where only specific people could enter, can enter. So, I mean, all of that also comes to our head. But, uh, but ideally, when we talk of altar, uh, it's everything what you all just shared. It was a place, it was a place of surrender, submission. It was a place of worship, like you know what I'm saying, right? It was a place of forgiveness uh, and, and so many other things. Uh, in, it was the place where humanity would meet with divinity. Uh, you know, that's where God would meet as well. So, um, and one of the key verses that's actually not in the Bible, uh, not in the notes that I shared, uh, but if we can look at uh, Exodus chapter 20, verse 24. Okay, Exodus chapter 20, verse 24. It says, uh, make an altar of earth for me and sacrifice on it your burnt offerings and fellowship offerings, your sheep and goats and your cattle. Wherever I cause my name to be honored, I will come to you and bless you. Okay, wherever I cause my name to be honored, I will come to you and bless you. I'm reading from the NIV. I hope that's okay. But it's what, what was interesting is an altar was a place of us honoring him, honoring his name, honoring who he is. An altar, uh, I, I, I found that, you know, super interesting, you know. And, and as we study through the life of Abraham, which we will in just a minute, uh, we, one thing, uh, one of the conclusions that I could come out of it was, an altar was a place where uh, the old ends and the new begins. Okay, I'll say that again. Uh, in the context of Abraham's lives, um, which can be applied in our lives, is a the altar was a place where the old ended and new began. Okay, um, so uh, having said that, um, let's just look at uh, you know your notes in page four and right on top the four altars of Abraham okay um, Yahweh God commanded Abraham to leave his land his relatives and his father's house Abraham obeyed without hesitating and left Ur Okay, uh, now just for reference sake, can we go to Genesis chapter 12, please? Okay, let's go to Genesis chapter 12. Is, uh, any, any point in time, if I'm going too fast, uh, uh, please let me know, sorry. Okay, so uh, the Dave, sorry, I missed your thing. What I, it was Exodus. 
Sales so chapter 20, verse 24, what we just read. And we are, and right now we are just going back to Genesis chapter 12. So Genesis chapter 12, verse 1, it says, The Lord had said to Abram, Leave your country, your people, and your father's household and go to the land I will show you. Okay, uh, so interesting. Leave your country, your people, and your father's household and go to the land I will show you. Um, there are so many hard things that God is asking Abraham to do. You know, one, leave your country, just go to another country, go to another land, leave your people and and leave your father's household, leave your family, leave the people that you know, leave the country that you are familiar with, uh, and go. And one of the interesting lines there is, go to the land, I will show you. That means God has still not shown the land to Abraham. You, you see what I'm saying? Okay, so that is the context uh, you know, we're in. So it's coming back to our notes. Um, God commanded Abraham to leave his land, his relatives, and his father's house. Abraham obeyed without hesitating and left his country, his people, his family, he left. Throughout his journey, Abraham built four altars. Uh, they represent the stages of his experience, the growth in faith, uh, you know, his commitment, uh, his coming back, uh, you know, from going away. Uh, they show how he behaved himself and how he grew as a person and how his intimacy uh, with God grew. Okay. Uh, so, but one of the important things that we need to remember is that when God called Abraham, Abraham, Abram, Abram, Abraham, sorry if I go back and forth, was an idol worshiper. Okay, he came from uh, from the land, from the people, a place where idols were worshipped, uh, from polytheistic, okay, a polytheism, that's many gods. God was calling him from polytheism to monotheism, okay? one god, okay, that, that is it, and you can't see me, this invisible god, and God was calling him out of idol worship. And when the Lord called him to leave Ur of the Chaldeans, and began a journey of faith. He became a father of faith and a friend of God. Okay, the, one of the key uh, important lines there I'd like for you to remember is he began a journey of faith. Okay, uh, let me try. I want to share a map, uh, if possible. Um, with you just to show us the journey that uh, you know Abraham took. Okay. All right. Can you all see uh, the map? Yes. Yes, sir. Okay. Cool. So um, you see, this is over here. Oh, by the way, the red line here is the journey of Abraham. Ignore the purple, blue, and the other stuff, okay? Just keep an eye on the red, um, just so we understand a little bit, okay? So this was actually his journey of faith. He was supposed to leave this country and come all the way up here and go there, and then here, and then come down, down, and down, and down. Just spend some time here and then come down to Bethel, Hebron, Beersheba, Shul. And you see that it's it's quite an incredible journey, isn't it? Uh, right? Um, when I found this, I, it, was fun. it was amazing. Uh, you know, one of the most beautiful things, again, just coming back to that line, is that God said, Go to the land, I will show you. That means when Abraham began, he did not know that he was coming to the other side of the land altogether. He didn't know. Um, 
Okay, he was coming from the land of idol worship. Uh, he was familiar. His family was here. He knew his people, uh, his kind of uh, people, his, the race, uh, everything. Uh, he, and then God would just, you know, choose him. And from this day, you are going to be a different nation. God calls and Abraham just said, okay, Lord, if you say so. <laughs> he goes on this incredible journey. All right, uh, let me stop sharing it. Okay, um, another interesting thing is going back to your notes uh, is that God records in the book of Hebrews in chapter 11 uh, four statements about the life of Abraham, which kind of corresponds to these four altars uh, referred in the book of Genesis. Okay, it's, it's so beautiful, uh, beautifully put together, uh, uh, you know, what the Hebrews say about Abraham and his altars that he built, right? So you guys with me so far? Yeah? Yeah. Okay, so uh, just to sum up uh, what we've covered, altars was a place of uh, worship, was a place of sacrifice like you shared, was a place of forgiveness, was a place of surrender. It was a place where God's name was honored. It was a place where God the divinity would meet with humanity. It was a place where worship was accepted. Uh, you know, um, so yeah, um, this is dive a little more, more deeper into understanding, uh, you know, what altars are before we start, you know, uh, going into the altars that Abraham built. Um, the word altar in scripture simply means a place of slaughter and sacrifice where blood was shed and death took place. Okay, it was a place where blood was shed and death took place. I want you to remember the, that line, death took place. Okay, it symbolized acknowledgement of, approach to, how you would approach, uh, you know, an appreciation of God. In other words, simply, in other words, it means worship okay it was a place where you would acknowledge who god is he is good he is jehovah jireh he's my healer he is my provider he is my strength my shield he is my strong tower my mighty fortress you are acknowledging everything about him and then how you would approach you would approach with a place of reverence knowing that he is almighty he is the alpha and he is the omega he is the only true god right and then you would appreciate you be thankful with praise and worship okay so that was altar so just a couple of points uh, i've mentioned in the notes for us point one primarily an altar was a place of worship where god was adored for who he, he is and what he has done, okay? It was a place uh, where God was adored, where he was honored for who he is and what he has done, um, which is very important for us to remember, guys. In, if he doesn't do anything else in our lives, if he doesn't do another miracle or doesn't another healing, uh, that does not make him unworthy. If, that's, that's the beauty of this worship and place of coming to this place of worship is that regardless, God is worthy. He was adored. He, you know, for who he is, he is sovereign. Uh, and for what he has done, for what, for the price that he's paid for us on the cross. Um, okay. And only burnt offerings were offered to him in the days of the patriarchs. Uh, since the law of Moses was not yet given. Uh, point two, an altar was a place of testimony to the only true God in the midst of the widespread idolatry. Okay, the altar was a place of testimony to the only true God. And why I say that is, you now, other religions uh, back then, you know, the, the Canaanites or the, the Baal worshippers, uh, the idolaters, they also built altars, but there was always an idol on that altar that they worshipped. But only the altars that the patriarchs built had nothing else. 
was just plain altar and a sacrifice would go on it. Okay. Um, so Abraham built his altars unto the Lord and that there he called upon his name. We, uh, we look at those scriptures in just a minute as we go on. Third point, an altar was also a place of communion between God and the worshiper. It was a place of communication. It was a place where God would make his covenant, uh, you know, with his people. And we'll see that time and time again. So it was a place of communion between God and the worshiper, where instructions were often given by the Lord and received by his son. Okay, so very quickly, guys. Uh, first one, the altar was a place of worship. It was a place where you would acknowledge and adore and appreciate uh, who God is, right? It was a place of worship. Second, it was a place of testimony to uh, amongst every other idol, idol worship that was happening around, uh, say that he is the only true God and he is worthy of our praise. And third point, so it was a place of communication. It was a place of communion, okay, community, uh, coming together. Uh, they would come together in unity uh, where God would speak and, and the worshiper would make notes uh, of his instructions, etc., uh, etc. Et okay, so this is what an altar represents. Uh, and in all of this, uh, again, I want to go back to that point uh, in, in the beginning of the statement is, uh, right on top, the word altar in scripture simply means it was a place of salt, a slaughter and sacrifice where blood was shed and death took place. Okay. Yeah. Uh, is everybody okay so far? Yeah. Uh, yeah anything you'd like to, uh, what you want to share, you want to add to what we've discussed so far, guys? Okay. Uh, please remember, uh, you know, if if there's if I ask a question, um, you know, if I'm uh, if I'm asking you to share anything, uh, please don't think twice about sharing the right answer, you know, because there is not expecting the right answer or the wrong. One. There's no right or wrong answer. Okay, feel free to share, no matter how silly you think it might be or whatever it is, because um, that's how we will learn. Okay, I hope that's all cool. All right, so let's move on. Uh, thing now we've understood uh, what altars are, and we understood we understand a little background of who Abraham was. Okay, now we'll go into studying uh, his four altars. In page number five, now uh, in the notes I've just given uh, you know a name to these altars. The first altar is called as the altar of obedience, and second altar you know, an altar of intimacy, but, uh, you know, this is not just, these are the points, uh, you know, that I, I thought I would add, and that means it's not exhaustive. What I mean by that is, this is it, nothing else, okay? That's not the point, but God might speak to you about something else from the altar, you know, uh, of the first altar that Abraham built, but uh, when I was preparing, uh, you know, this is what stood out to me. Okay, the first altar, okay, the first altar in your notes, page five. I'm calling it the altar of obedience. So, after Abraham arrived in Canaan, the Bible tells us that the first place he went to was Shechem. Okay, in Shechem, he built an altar. Uh, I think uh, what I'd like to do is uh, I'd like to leave that uh, map uh, on us so that we kind of understand, uh, you know, the place of the geography. It's very important for us to understand the geography, and I hope that's okay. Yeah. So the first place, so he's come from this place, Ur, and he's come all the way to here. This is where Shechem is. Okay. And, uh, and that's where he builds his first altar. So... 
In Shechem, he built an altar. It is an altar associated with uh, the proof of obedience, uh, which started when Abraham left Ur. Okay, in Genesis chapter 12, verse 6 and 7, Abraham passed through the land to the place of Shechem, which means shoulder and support. Okay, the, the meaning of the, uh, the place Shechem means shoulder, support. Uh, okay, nothing's there by accident, guys. There's, these meanings tell us something about God. You know, okay? um, which goes to say that in this journey that Abraham started, the journey of faith, through it, and he reaches the point, God has been his shoulder. He could rely on his strength. He has been his support. And as far as the terebinth tree of Morah, Mora means teacher, the Canaanites were in the land. Okay. And then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, to your descendants, I will give you, I will give this land. And there he built an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. Okay. Uh, one of the important things now, if it was me, right, when God, okay, God shows up, uh, you know, remember that line, okay, leave everything and go, I will show you the land. That means Abraham didn't know. He reached a certain point, and then God shows up and he says, and what does he say to your descendants? I will give this land. He doesn't say to you. I'm sure if it was me, it was, it was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I came thousands of miles, okay, and you're not giving me, you're giving it to my descendants, what's the point? <laughs> but uh, Abraham, Abraham doesn't respond. When God says that to your descendants, I will give this land, there he built an altar to the Lord as a response, right, um, who had appeared to him. Now, as a parallel, uh, any of you have a Bible, so let's just go to Hebrews 11. Um, the scriptures are there in your in the notes, but uh, you know, let's just go to Hebrews 11, if you don't mind. Hebrews 11, verse 8. Okay. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 8. It says, by faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place, he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. That's wonderful, isn't it? He obeyed and went without hesitation, without thinking twice, uh, you know, Okay, where is this land? Does it have clean air? Okay, is there water supply there? Uh, you know, what about the food quality, uh, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. What about the quality of life? Uh, is there good schools around for my kids, <laughs> etc.? Cetera, et cetera. Some of the things that we as people would uh, consider, isn't it? Uh, you know, when you choose to go to a certain city, you will take all of these factors into consideration. Does it have good educational system? Does it have good roads? Uh, which Bangalore doesn't, <laughs> uh, does it have a good water system? Does this area have water problems, etc., etc.? We would have all these questions, isn't it? But it feels like here, when God told Abraham to go, he just left without hesitation, without thinking twice, whatever it is, wherever it is, he just took and he just left. He left everything, his people, his family, his father's house, and he left simply because God told him to go. So the building, and you're coming back to your notes, the building of this altar, therefore, corresponds to Hebrews 11, 8, which we just read, which states it was by faith that Abraham obeyed when God called him to leave home and go to another land that God would give him as his inheritance. Uh, what I want to stand, uh, you know, kind of highlight for us as relevance in our context is um, not just in worship ministry, but in ministry as general uh, or in life. Uh, how much are you willing to trust and obey? How much? You know, because that is the first step, obedience. Uh, obedience is better than sacrifice, as the scripture says. There's nothing more pleasing to God 
than obedience. Um, and I say, I use the word pleasing to God, right? Because the, again, the Hebrews says, I think Hebrews, I'm not sure, forgive me, uh, says, uh, you cannot please, without, without faith, you cannot please God. Right? Without faith, you cannot please God. And so it is by faith you please him. And one of the aspects of that is obedience. And obedience pleases him. Obedience shows that you have faith in God. Right? Um, so that's the first altar, uh, an altar of obedience. Um, all right, let's move on to the second one. The second altar, uh, and I'm calling it the altar of intimacy and of the pilgrim walk. Okay, an altar of intimacy and pilgrim walk. Uh, in Genesis chapter 12, verse 8. And he moved from there to the mountains east of Bethel, and he pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and Ai I on the east. Okay. With Bethel on the west and I on the east. There he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. Okay. I've mentioned only Genesis 12 verse 8, but uh, um, I'd, I'd like for us to um, just read the previous scriptures. Um, Genesis 12, from verse 6, right? Genesis chapter 12, verse 6 onwards. Abram traveled through the land as far as the site of the great tree of Morah, Ashekim. At the time the Canaanites were in the land, the Lord appeared to Abraham and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who appeared to him. From there he went on toward the hills east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and Ai on the, on the east. There he built an altar to the Lord, another altar. Okay, So the second place he went to was Bethel. Uh, you can look at the map here from Michigan. He's coming down south, right? I'm sure he's coming down south. Um, he goes to Bethel. There also he built another altar. Um, then he went, and so it was around that he went to, uh, he, he went from Egypt to the south, and from south he went back to Bethel, uh, staying in between Bethel and Hai, uh, to, the, to the place where he built his first altar. Um, this altar is associated with the test and the motives of his heart. This altar uh, shows that he is growing in intimacy uh, with the Lord, an altar of increased familiarity and growth of intimacy. Uh, by now, he's learning that he can, you know, uh, you know, depend on his word, uh, and so he continues to build another altar. Okay. Um, in this altar corresponds to the statements in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 9. It says, and even when he reached the land God promised him, he lived there by faith. For he was like a foreigner living in tents. And so did Isaac and Jacob, who inherited the same promise. Okay, such an important verse this is in the life of Abraham, that even after he reached the promised land, Okay, he did not, he just didn't go start building towers and whatnot. Because again, we have to remember, guys. Um, uh, actually, this is in, in Genesis chapter 11, right? Uh, let me just. Genesis 11. People were all about building their own cities, building huge monuments. Okay, so in Genesis uh, 11, Genesis 11, verse. Genesis 11 verse 3. Uh, we all know the stories, the, it's the origins of the Tower of Babel. Okay, Verse 3, it says, They said to each other, Come, let's make bricks and bake them thoroughly. 
they used brick instead of stone and tar mortar. And verse four says, then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves and not, this, and not to be scattered over the face of the whole earth. Okay, verse four, just the first line, come let us build ourselves a city with the tower that reaches to the heavens. You see, this was the culture of the people. This was, this is the, just the previous chapter before God speaks with Abraham. But uh, when you, when you, and when Hebrews chapter 11 was named and you read it, he says, you know, the writer of the Hebrews says, even when Abraham reached the land that God promised him, he did not start building towers or building cities, uh, monuments and whatnot. He says he lived there by faith for he was like a foreigner living in tents. Okay. Uh, people living in tents, they, they were like nomad, nomads, right? They would constantly be on the move. Those were the kind of people who would live in a tent so they can pick up the tent, pack it and go on. Right. So um, he, in Acts 7 verse 5, it says he owned not even so much as to set his foot on. That's what he thought. Okay, he's he, he he's like, I don't even own a foot in this land. So that's why I'm going to live in the tents. In Acts chapter 7 verse 5, he says, he gave him no inheritance here, not even enough ground to set his foot on. But God promised him that he and his descendants after him would possess the land, even though at the time Abraham had no child. Okay, uh, so his faith is growing by this point. His, he's just, again, solely depending on that intimacy, intimacy with God, that intimate relationship, that bond, that, that communion is just growing and growing by this point. Um, and I, I, I love this poem by Thomas R. Taylor. Um, I am but a stranger here. Heaven is my home. Earth is a desert drear. Heaven is my home. Danger and sorrow stand around me on every hand. Heaven is my fatherland. Heaven is my home. By Thomas R. Taylor. So uh, this altar should encourage us to, to live a pilgrim's life, knowing that we are just passing through uh, you know, our life on earth, where uh, he calls us for our eyes to be fixed on eternity. You know, and uh, Paul writes, fix your eyes on things above and encourages us to live life as a pilgrim by faith, just like Abraham lived. And that's how our, our intimacy also you know, deepens. Okay. Uh, any thoughts so far? Anything you anything you guys li would like to add? Is this kind of stood out? To you? Sharon, Manu, Kiran, Kanan. Yes, no, maybe. Actually, uh, when we read uh, about Abraham in the Bible, he's the wealthiest person. But still, Hebrew says that he looking forward to uh, is to coming the eternal life. He looked there and yeah. lived in it and, and lived a life in yeah. a simple way. That's yeah. amazing uh, when you read yeah. about Abraham. Yes, uh, Thomas, yeah. Yeah, 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 and, and I think uh, as as ministers of God, especially people you know chosen to do His work in ministry, um, and I think it is so crucial to have our eyes fixed on eternity, on Him, uh, you know, and, and when that is clear, when that vision I think is clear, uh, everything else becomes easier. And uh, and I feel you know, um, it, and I think that's why it was easy for Abraham. 
But again, that's not to say that Abraham was all perfect. Uh, he was far from perfect, and uh, you know we'll we, we'll see that in you know in the next two points that we're going to look at. Okay. Um, but what I'd like to do now, I I'd like to pause because we have uh, you know five minutes to go for our break. And pause here. We'll take a break, and uh, you know, and I'll see you all back in ten a.m. Is that cool? So stop sharing. Yeah. Yeah. Intimacy is beautiful. Yeah. Um, and and the thing again, uh, one of the things again that stands out to me is that in that intimate relationship is not born overnight. Doesn't happen like that. You know, microwave results, you know, we expect the men of God to put their hands on us and they're like, okay, you know, that can't be transferred so easily. It's a journey, isn't it? Um, Abraham just took a long journey and in that journey, he began to trust God. And in that journey, there, his intimacy with God grew deeper and deeper. Okay, so, yeah. I guess, so, uh, I'll just... We pause here for this uh, for this session, and uh, we'll come back after a break and we'll resume. Okay, I'll see you all in ten minutes. Okay, thank you, sir. 